their team had a conference call on Thursday, 5th of April, 2018. Jordan, Brennan, Ed, and I talked on the conference bridge Ed set up for about 45 minutes. We covered a lot of ground and got some idea of next steps. We have a repository that has GNU Radio draft blocks that do the Pi over 2 BPSK demodulation and decoding that is used in the physical layer header. And we need to get it working as a correlator. Brendan Ashton reviewed our block and didn't see any major issues yet. And then he went out to see what he could see about the correlation estimation block. This is a block that is already in GNU Radio, and it has been flagged with an issue for a while. Please review Brennan's pull request here. This is an attempt to solve this issue here. The links are in the notes. Which, if successful, will help us and a lot of other people. This effort is in progress and will be updated as the code is reviewed and feedback from GNU Radio given. We have a 10 GHz filter design proposed from Jeffrey Paulin. It covers the 10 GHz amateur band, has 0.1 dB variation over the band, 0.1 dB insertion loss, and 20 to 30 dB return loss. And this is all from simulation. It's a high-performance filter, and we are talking about how to get it published, how many prototypes to build, and what the potential market might be. Here's the first four documents from Jeffrey. These are in the repository at the link in the notes. If you have feedback, we want to hear it. We are sponsoring a block party at GNU Radio Conference 2018. This is a multi-day hackfest workshop and summit all about making an open source DVB-S2 and DVB-S2X receiver in GNU Radio. Come and help. We have five solid technical docents for the event, and we could use some more. The goal is to bring blocks and write blocks on site, test interoperability, and leave the conference with a working DVB-S2 receiver. This is the central mission for the successful continued research and development, and we need all hands on deck. If you have never coded a block in GNU Radio, then don't worry. It wasn't until the past year that I had ever coded up a block for GNU Radio. I just had never needed to. There's a series of guided tutorials from GNU Radio's website. The link is in the notes. Go there, or search them up with GNU Radio guided tutorials, walk through them, and you will have the tools and the workflow experience to be able to contribute. Having said that, if you are only comfortable coding in Python or C++, then that's okay too. If you have an idea for getting some part of the DVB-S2 or S2X digital signal processing done, and either don't have the time to work through block coding, or pi bombs, distribution, or anything GNU Radio specific, then you can certainly still help by sharing your signal processing code. Don't let GNU Radio block configuration stop you. You're needed and appreciated. Phil Karn has shared a work in progress with us. He calls it the KA9Q SDR. However, the module in this SDR code that I'd like to highlight is a stereo field audio adapter. The code and early documentation has been uploaded to our repository, and the link is in the notes. Phil Karn writes, I'm writing a lightweight modular SDR package that uses IP multicast for intermodule communication. Multicasting is very flexible and convenient for this sort of real-time application, and I really think it should become standard practice. One module is an audio decoder player. I'm often running several SDRs at once, so I wrote it to handle multiple multicast streams. Since several mixed audio streams can be confusing, I've been experimenting with ways to help the user distinguish them. I started with a simple text display that lists the streams and their types and sources, highlighting those that are currently active. You can individually adjust levels or ignore those you don't want. Since most sources are mono, I added the ability to give each one its place in the stereo aural image. I'm trying to recreate the famous cocktail party effect that in person helps you pick out one voice from several talking at once. Audio engineers typically place a source in a stereo image with a mixer pan pot that adjusts its gain in each channel. This works, sort of. I, I wanted to find something better. So I read up on auditory perception. I learned that we distinguish the direction of a sound only partly by the level difference between our ears, as that doesn't actually change much as your head turns. The real cue is the difference in arrival time. The speed of sound is about 340 meters per second. So if our ears are 30 centimeters apart, measuring around the head, that's a little less than a millisecond. 
Now this didn't seem like much, but it was very easy to add these small delays to the pan pots in my player, and it works. The effect is almost eerie. You have to listen to each channel in turn to convince yourself that the levels are almost the same. Conference calls, or round tables, as we hams call them, are very important in communications. I've long thought we can make them much better, especially in how we handle several simultaneous speakers. If we use this scheme to place each participant in a round table, we should get a lot closer to that in-person experience that's so difficult to produce in electronic communications. All of this requires that each participant receives every other participant as a separate stream. There's no central conference bridge that mixes everybody together. This is a perfect application for IP multicasting. Not only can you put each participant in its place, the status display shows you at a glance who's talking. You can squelch an individual who keeps disrupting the meeting, and you can even have a private aside by sending a unicast traffic rather than multicasting it to the entire group. A lot of this was done as research in the early days of what became voice over IP, but it seems to have fallen by the wayside. It really deserves to be more widely recognized and used. This is from Phil Karn, KA9Q, 9th of April, 2018. We are making great progress on the careful COTS relayout of a USRP E310 with future plans to tackle the E320. We're collaborating with AMSAT Golf on this and have gained enthusiastic support from Edis Research Engineering. The next steps are to negotiate what's needed on the business side. Scheduling talks is in progress. If you're not familiar with the term, careful COTS, COTS means commercial off the shelf, is taking something that wasn't designed specifically for space and making it work for space environments. This is done by selection of the right components, designing in redundancy at the system level, and testing the entire system for radiation tolerance. We have a high degree of confidence that the Edis USRP will work, and we have some volunteers willing to do the work. If you are interested in this part of the project, let me know. Badge update. The trans-ionospheric badge prototypes are being built at a contract manufacturer in San Diego right now. We are working hard to have them at Hamvention for sale. All proceeds benefit Phase 4 ground. They aren't just for show. They will be a radio peripheral for Phase 4 ground radios, providing a lot of visual reinforcement on what your radio is doing and the health and status of your link. Whether you have a satellite or a terrestrial system, the same information will be stylishly displayed. We are working hard to make it possible to command other radios as well. More on that as it develops. Okay, this is the coin mech out of an Eagle gumball machine. See, this actuates the main mechanism. This little metal tab and the spring steel that forces it down are the interlock mechanism for the coins. If I put a quarter in the slot, you can see it, it appears there. And as I turn the knob, it can come around. And the quarter drops out. If I continue turning, you'll see the, the quarter slot start to come into view. Notice that little notch there. That's what engages the metal tab. If I can go that far and no farther, as long as this metal tab is under spring pressure and allowed to go into the slot. So to make this go free, all I have to do is remove the screw and the tab and the, the spring and it will be free. In order to make it controllable, we have to somehow replace that metal tab with something we can activate. Okay, I've removed the spring and the little teeter-totter. The spring just holds down this little teeter-totter. It's pretty thick, strong piece. But it turns out that's not all there is to it. Now it still won't go. And you can see it through this hole a little golden piece there that moves. And it requires the quarter to be full height. Put the quarter in and turn it. You see it pushes the golden thing out of the way. So not only do we have to defeat the teeter-totter, we also have to defeat that mechanism. I've removed the four mounting screws. Let's see if that's enough. In that. 
So here you can see the extra mechanism that detects the height of the quarter. This is a piece of spring steel again. It pushes this up against the rotary part. Okay, part of the trick will be knowing when to activate the mechanism that pulls back this little golden piece. But we also need to know when we've gone past there, when we finally committed to dispensing a token. Put the quarter in there just to make it easy for, them for now. So there's this point where it actually decides whether there's a quarter in there, or in our case, whether we're allowed to dispense. But then once it goes past that, now we're actually committed and can't go back. If you want to be part of this effort, then join our Slack and mailing list at the link in the notes. Write me for an invitation to Slack. All are welcome. This project is intended to spread enjoyment, appreciation, and success in broadband digital communications at Microwave for amateur radio use. A lot of what we do is complex and challenging, but we are here to help, and you can contribute at any level. Thank you for all the support and interest. If you have suggestions or questions or something you think we need to know about, let us know. If all goes well, we'll see you next week.